Yeah. Centers, we have a little tradition here that we give everyone who visits us the icon of St. James. Oh, how nice. And I would just like to personally thank you for being with us. For oh, today. that's very sweet. And hope thank you. Will you. Come back. I'd like to. Okay, good. Welcome down. I've really, I've really enjoyed my time with you. I really have. Oh, good. I'm hoping you will come back. Yeah, I'm glad it was three Sundays and not just two. Well, I've been out a little early today. We have some technical things going on today, so I need to thank you. Excuse me. I understand. Okay. Shall we begin? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I would like to elaborate a little bit on. Um, on the dictum that we not moralize while reading the text of the Bible, but, mor but theologize. Um, we already mentioned that if we moralize, then we're stuck with trying to, to find ways to uh, understand or accept some um, Bronze Age and Iron Age ethics, and, and I hope we're beyond some of that. Um, but what does it mean to theologize? It means in reading the text, not ask what we should do, but to ask what it says God was doing with the, what he had to work with at that time. And, um, and a very tribalistic, welcome Yarkins. Good to see you again, Ann. Um, so, so that, um, we try to discern what it, now some of what, of course, you'd end up seeing what God was doing is, is not very felicitous either, because these are very, very strange texts. They are very foreign to us. But let's, let's look at some of what we can um, uh, say about this. One thing I'd like to say right away, Cindy, is that I really like at the close of the lecture and readings, that you have, hear what the Spirit is saying. Now, to God's people, I could change that to all of us or to everybody or whatever, but um, I, I really like that. In, in our parish, we uh, have the expression. Sorry, you would probably change it, what? Would change it, hear what the Spirit is saying. Just hear what the Spirit is saying. Just hear what the Spirit is saying. Okay. To us, to anybody can hear it. Uh, I, I, I like that very much. In, in our parish, we still have the word of, of God, and, and that is, is, makes of the Bible on another divinity. Uh, even speaking of it as the Holy Bible, it somehow is elevated to semi-divine, and, and that permits people then to go and read it, and whatever verse they land on is the verse they live by today, and so on. And without regard to what it originally meant at all. So I like what, what you do there. Um, and also, I, I would think that it would mean that we don't demonize others and those with whom we disagree. This, to monotheize, uh, would be to ask, what, how do they provide a mirror for us to see ourselves? But if we demonize them and say that they're evil and they're, they are all wrong and we're all right, then we don't have the, the um, blessing or the gift of being able to see ourselves in them. An example would be um, Nazis. If you call somebody a Nazi, that's awful, it's terrible. Um, they nearly destroyed London, they uh, did all things wrong, etc. But we have to think about the good Christians, die gute Christen, in Germany who supported Hitler. And if we're going to be able to see ourselves at all in that situation, we can't demonize all the German people. We have to ask, what is it that they did that we can see ourselves in? What can we learn for ourselves that they were doing. How was it that they could possibly support such a person? Well, do we find ourselves asking that question today? Yes, we do. But we can't do it if we demonize others. And militarily speaking, I suppose that we soldiers have to be taught to demonize or otherwise they can't kill people. But 
do we all have to do that? Can't we find a way to see in others our own foils? And uh, we should have to learn, it seems to be, if we're going to progress at all, if the monetizing process is going to grow, progress at all for the world, we have to be able to see ourselves in them. In, in this country, um, I think often, because I grew up in the South, of, of the uh, Civil War, which I grew up learning <coughs> that it was called the War Between the States. Um, but now everybody loves everybody. I mean, the, the blue and the gray hardly make any difference at all. We do have these controversies about statues and flags and things like that. But um, we, did, did it take a hundred years for us to try to see each other as neighbors, as friends, as brothers and sisters? It takes, sometimes it takes an awfully long time to love our enemy. In that case, it took at least 100 years. I grew up in the South where as soon as Reconstruction was over because President Johnson made sure that it would be, he was in Tennessee, um, uh, they, the Jim Crow laws were instigated. And it was just as bad, if not worse, than slavery. I grew up seeing a form of slavery which was horrendous on the farms that the Sanders family had in Fayette County in Tennessee. Uh, how do we love our enemies? How do we mon monotheize? These are, these are some, some ways of thinking about it. Um, how, how did these prophets, beginning with Amos, who came from a small town in Judah, uh, practically in the desert out east of Bethlehem, um, uh, how did he, how did he come, well, how was he able to say the things that he said? Uh, he, at one point, chapter 3, verse 1, says, God, he quotes God, you are the only family on the face of the earth that I have known. Well, everybody would agree with that. We're, we're special. We're exceptional. Uh, we, we, you know, we're the, we're the first country that's done this, that, and the other. We're, we're, but Amos went on to say, therefore, I will punish you. No wonder they threw him out of town <laughs> because he didn't end up saying the right thing. He should have said, therefore God will take care of us. God is our God and our God will take care of us. How did they learn this? How, how could an Amos learn to say such things? Are you not like the Ethiopians to me? Did I not bring the Philistines from Kaftor and the Syrians from Kir? So you had a migration from Egypt. You, had a, you have a wonderful story you have, of escape from Egypt, wanderings in the desert. And the, so did other people. What do you mean? You, we're, 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 we're not exceptional? Therefore, I will punish you. This is in the Bible. But do we know it in our lectionaries? No, no, no. We never read those passages. We only read the passages that offer hope in the future because we say, Christ, our Christ, fulfill that hope. And it isn't our Christ at all. It's God's Christ. If we monotheize. Well, Amos probably would have learned it because Tekoa was a center for wisdom thinking at that time. Wisdom thinking. What was wisdom thinking? What do you, what, what do you, how do you, how do you begin to think about wisdom? We said, well, what the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and, and um, uh, the Song of Solomon? We have, we have, no, what we have to know is wisdom pertained from early on, right on through the whole of history of the formation of the Bible. Wisdom was derived in large part from nomadic thinking. And nomads had no boundaries. You have, you have nomads today in, in, in the Sinai Peninsula. They don't pay any attention to boundaries. They pay attention to where the water supply is or where the f food supply is for the, for the flocks. Boundaries about nothing. W women, I think, I teach my students every year that the, to think about wisdom, think about women, the work of women. They can look across the border and have immediate contact without a word spoken 
with the women there because they all know. They all suffer the, the same monthly pains. They all suffer childbirth. They suffer men. There's, a, there, there, there's no boundaries to that. <laughs> Wisdom. Wisdom. I think that Amos learned it from that area. Why do we know of Tekoa being a wisdom center? Because of 2 Samuel 14, about the wise woman of Tekoa, who went in cahoots with, uh, with uh, Joab, uh, was it, I think, who wanted to approach King David because David was getting old and so on, and they thought up a story. And the story was this, that she went to the king with a hypothetical court case in 2 Samuel 14. She says, I had two sons, and they fell to fighting in the field one day, and one son killed the other. And now the, the authorities want to kill or punish my son by death because of his murdering his brother. But please, my... Oh, what did the king say is, prithee, my lord, the king, do not let them quench my husband's one remaining ember. Please don't let them kill my murderer, murderer's son. And David finally said, because she importuned him, he said, much, all right, all right, I will not a hair of the head of your son will fall to the ground. Wisdom. Wisdom thinking. This is, with, Amos would have learned it very well, I think. And it becomes a way that you interpret scripture and tradition. Uh, let's, let's look at Micah chapter 6. It's a very familiar passage. I'll read it. You don't have to get. Uh, Micah chapter 6. Uh, Bill here could probably recite it by heart. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a passage um, about the uh, covenant lawsuit. It starts out in typical covenant lawsuit manner. And when, the, when God calls together all the various gods all around, the minor gods that we talked about last week. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, that is the mountain deities. Let the hills hear your voice, the gods of the hill. Let hear you mountains, the covenant lawsuit, the controversy of the Lord, and your enduring foundations to the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with his own people, and he will contend with Israel. And then he asks, O oh, my people, what have I done to you? And what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. They were, they were sea of the Episcopalians because they could chant these things, you see. I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage. I sent you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak King of Moab advised what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered what happened from Shittim to Gilgad. What did happen from Shittim to Gilgad? They crossed the Jordan. Shittim was the last campsite on the east side. Gilgal, the first. What happened? They entered into the blessings, and every blessing is an occasion for sin because we humans take blessings as something that we own, something that's ours and forget that they're gifts. What shall I come before the Lord? What, what, shall, I, what shall I offer God? Shall I, should it be uh, burnt offerings of calves a year old? No. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? No. How do you say no? Because you go back and read the recital, the story, the gospel. I brought you to the land of Egypt and redeemed your house of bondage. I sent you, I, and you crossed the Jordan. Is, are there any oil there, any rams? No, no. 
Shall I give my firstborn for the transgression of food? Must I look back up the story, the gospel story? Is there any? No, nothing. But he has shown you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. How do you know that? Look back up at the story. Ah, because that's what God did for you. So you ask, what does God do? It's not quite imitatio dei, imitation of God, but it's close to it. You recite the story, recite the gospel story in your mind, what God has done, not, not what we were supposed to do, but recite what God has done, and then say, what can I in this situation do that would be most like that? That would be the moralizing. That's the point at which we moral. Generation after generation after generation, the story, the gospel story, we say birth, death, and resurrection, same points. <clears throat> it's what God has done. Because you see, it is God's Christ, not our Christ who revealed God. It is God who showed Christ to us in what God could live as a human being and ask what it is God has done. Uh, Jeremiah 7, we could read that. Isaiah 28, 16 is wonderful. We won't do it. With time flies always. Um, uh, Isaiah 28, the Assyrian army, this is 701 BC. The Assyrian army is out uh, building, building um, uh, siege ramps and siege machines. You can see this reading. Second Kings, and uh, they hadn't completed them according to Second Kings, but they were building them, and the people could see them, and and uh, people in Jerusalem are scared, naturally. Um, the Assyrians are going to take the city; they're very very scared, and Isaiah says to them uh, that God has building as providing a cornerstone of a sure foundation. What? We're worried about the Assyrians out here catapulting stones into the city? And you're talking about a, a stone of a sure foundation? What do you mean? And the stone will have an inscription on it. And the inscription will be Hamamin lo yachish. What is that inscription? And what is that stone? The inscription says, he who has or she who has faith that God is God will not be in a frenzy. And what is the stone? It's an Assyrian sea stone. And the question then that Isaiah 28 poses for them and for us is, do we believe that God can convert an enemy's siege stone into a sure course, stone for a sure foundation in the future. Do we believe that or not? Is it possible to read that? Well, we Christians say that God took the symbol of Roman persecution and horrible punishment, the cross, and turned it into a sign of salvation. So the answer to the question, I say it's 28 verse 16, would be, yes, we believe that God can turn an Assyrian siege stone into a cornerstone of a sure foundation for the future. It's hard. We already spoke, spoke of in our first session today about what I, exile meant, that when you finally have nothing of God's gifts to deceive you. Nothing, absolutely. See, please don't moralize and say, oh, I have to give up all God's gifts. That's not the point. The point is to theologize. Not rush up and say, what should I do? Ask what God has done. And recite that story over and over again to ourselves. Paul does it all the time. And then ask in that situation, what should we do? Let's look at Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> this is the sermon 
at Mount Nazareth. Uh, it would be tempting to spend all the time on that, but I have a couple of other things to say, um, and I want to hear from you. But Luke, Luke chapter 4, this is Luke's version of our Lord's uh, visitation or visiting his hometown of Nazareth, and he's asked at the synagogue there to uh, read the Haftarah portion. And if we, we have three portions or three readings of lectionaries in our worship services, First Testament, Epistle, and Gospel. That's what's common. Though they had two, Torah, that is something from Genesis to, to, uh, 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 through Deuteronomy, and second, from a prophetic passage from the prophets, Haftarah. And uh, so Jesus was invited to read the Haftarah portion, and the portion for that Sabbath at that time happened to be Isaiah 61. That is to say, the Jubilee Psalm of the Book of the Psalter. And so what he, he, uh, what he does is, uh, is to um, uh, turn to that passage, and he reads it, and he says... The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is a quotation of Isaiah 61, a little bit modified, of course, the way all preachers do. You know, a, a preacher, a, even very good preachers, uh, if they can't find the, the way they want it in one translation, they'll go look for another translation. Well, you, you sort of mix up. The way. Paul did it all the time between the Hebrew and the Greek translation. This is from the Greek translation, but a little bit modified. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, he sent me to proclaim a release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed, that's borrowed from Isaiah 35, it's a little different, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord, what, what is that? Acceptable year of the Lord. The Shanat Adonai, the acceptable year of the Lord. Eniaton dekton in Greek. Except, what would that be? The Jubilee year. That's the year. Well, you have, if you study Deuteronomy 15 and Leviticus 25, you see the, the, the uh, stipulations for Jubilee in the Jubilee year, which was every seventh year, according to Deuteronomy, every 50th year, according to Leviticus. You did three things. You forgave all debts, released all slaves, and most slaves were because of debtors' debts, debtors' slaves. And the third, return property to the original tribes that God assigned it to of the 12 tribes. That means that property that had been sold to satisfy a debt had to be turned back in, the debt forgiven, and the property returned originally. In other words, the ec economy of the period was totally erased, just totally slate clean. All slaves released, all debts re uh, forgiven. And now, how are you going to do that? <laughs> the, uh, the, if you ask the question, did Judaism ever do it? The answer is no. Uh, they had two ways of handling it. One, one was to, um, to uh, institute later on with the rabbis. Uh, maybe the Pharisees started with the Tanaim, but at any rate, to, to um, uh, have a uh, prose bull. In other words, in the, the, in the year just before the Jubilee, everybody would go to the courthouse and get a waiver. That's what prose bull means, Aramaic for waiver, and a prose boule in Greek. And you go and get a waiver so that you don't have to uh, forgive the debts. Well, that's understandable. How in the world is the tailor going to be able to buy a new bolt of cloth if the previous uh, guy that asked him to make the suit didn't pay for the suit? I mean, you can't, the economy would come crashing down. So the rabbis devised prose bull. That's, that's the answer. To that. But there was another way of handling it, and that was to say, ah, the jubilee won't happen in our time. God will proclaim the Shanat Ratzonah. And that's the way they understood it at Qumran, by the way, the 11 Q Melchizedek. That's the answer that they gave for it, was, 
well, ah, the, jub the jubilee won't happen every seventh year, every fifty. It'll happen when God proclaims it. Well, that's what this says. Jesus says that now that God has proclaimed it. And I'm here to tell you that's what he did. And the, the people were excited. This would be wonderful. Get rid of these damn Romans. I mean, this, this will be true. This will be a jubilee beyond. I mean, this is, this is just absolutely wonderful. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant. And he, and he said to them, he, he now preaching a sermon. And how does he preach the sermon? On the psalm of Isaiah 61. Uh, on, uh, yes, it's a psalm, actually, from Isaiah 61. How does he? He turns to 1 Kings 17 and then to 2 Kings 5. And uh, in doing so, he says... In truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah. But when the heavens were shut up, they had a drought for three and a half years, uh, a great famine on the land. What did Elijah do? He doesn't say. They knew. They would have known exactly. And in verse 26, he sent, uh, yes, he does say, sent to them but uh, to, to Zarephath in the land of Sidon. Then he turns to Elisha, 2 Kings 5. What did Elisha do? He, he cured the general of the worst enemy that Israel had ever had. He had a leprosy and he cured him. Our enemy. Well, what happened? The people who said, oh, these words of grace that he's preaching is so wonderful, after he had read the passage of Isaiah 61, but after he had preached on it, using the cases of Elijah and Elisha, they were hopping mad. They were so mad at him. Why were they mad? Well, first of all, why, how do they, what do they do? They wanted to take him to the brow of the hill of the city on uh, which the city was built in order to throw him down headlong, and that is prepared toward to stoning, and stoning is the punishment for blasphemy. And what is blasphemy? Blasphemy means you've said God is bigger than we thought he was, and you're, you're going to be killed for that. Anytime you say God's bigger than you thought, they'll be killed for that. <clears throat> so Jesus interprets Isaiah 61 by quoting, what, what did Elijah do? Elijah was sent to the brook Carrot in 1 Kings 17 by God because Ahab and Jezebel were, had, a, had a contract out on his head. And so he was hiding. And what is he going to do? It's a drought. So God commands ravens to feed him, besides having the book carrot to drink from. Oh, my goodness. When I grew up, what was the answer to that? Do you believe God can, that ravens can feed a man? Well, yes, you better believe God can feed a man or you're a heretic. No, that's not the point at all. The point is nobody in Israel helped Elijah. Nobody in the church helped God's man. Nobody. So God had to send you. Okay, the brook carrot dries up. We'll see you later, Cindy. The brook carrot dries up, and, and, uh, and, and Elijah goes up to a foreign country, just to a widow who's a foreigner. I mean, she's not in the church at all. She's, she's, a, she's a total foreigner, and, she, and he approaches her. There's a drought there also. And so she's going, she has a little bit of oil left and a little bit of flour. And she's going to make some cakes for herself and her son before they die. And Elijah says, yeah, but I'm hungry. You've got to give me some. And she did. And then he gave her a jar of oil that would never go empty. But don't ask first what Elijah did for her. Ask what that non-Christian, non-believing foreigner did for God's man. It's in the Bible. But will you hear it from the preachers in the evangelical churches or many other churches? No. But that's what the te text is about. God is the God of foreigners as well as of us. And sometimes foreigners act more like what God wants them to act than we do. That's the message. I'd, I'd, have, I'd, have, I'd have thrown it, I'd have stoned him too. I mean, the, 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 this is from a guy who's going to have a ministry now, according to Luke and the other gospel writers, that says the same thing, that God is the God of Romans 
as well as of Jews. And he says it over and over again. I ought to crucify him. This is, this is radical stuff. Very radical stuff. Namely, there's this one God, and God is the God of everybody, including Romans, including ourselves, including those we don't like. Now, don't be picayunish about it. Understand it as saying that we take those with whom we disagree as mirrors to see ourselves and what is possible in our camps that are just like those that we say were enemies of ours. Um, <clears throat> the monotheism process is not complete, will never be complete until all the world recognizes that we all have one God, are part of one reality, and we refuse to demonize others because they're different or disagree. But we should ask, why? That is the principal question, why? Why do they do what they do? Why do we do what we do? Rather than demonizing Palestinians because they throw a few rocks at, at occupying soldiers, ask why they throw those rocks because they are dehumanized every day. You saw it. I've seen it often over there. And yet, we say we want to support the only democracy in the area. But how can it be a democracy when it is now a big national ghetto? It has just been passed by the Knesset. I know I sound like a reformed Jew, that's because I studied with reformed Jews for four years in Cincinnati in the early 50s when um, there wasn't a single member of that faculty who were Zionists because that was the mission of Israel according to reformed Judaism. And what is the mission of Israel according to classical reformed Judaism? The Jews should get out of the ghetto. Now you're thinking about middle of the 19th century in Germany, Abraham Geiger and that group. Get out of the ghetto into the real world and live lives of Torah, that is, pursue social justice, so that's what Torah means, out in the real world as witness to your faith that God can plant a cornerstone in using and this, a, an, a, a, an enemy's assault stone. And that was their mission. That was the mission of Israel, according to Reform Judaism. We had orthopraxing uh, professors who were, who were totally committed to the Reform mission of Israel. Now, apparently, this, uh, it just, I'm constantly, reminded of how old I am, but now there's not a single member of that faculty who is not Zionist. They all are. What happened? 1967. According to 19, the Battle of 1967, you remember the Six Day War? I was there at the beginning of it with Mrs. Bechtel. Uh, were you there at that time? Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we were there trying to get permission to, to take photos. This is even before I got to... Oh, that, that uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Because uh, you see, she, she, uh, Mrs. Bechtel was my benefactress. She was the one who gave the money for the release of the Psalm Scroll from Cave 11 that I unrolled and, and published in, uh, in the 60s. And um, her interest was in preserving photographs of all the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was her interest. And I told her, I, I was on the faculty of Union Seminary and Columbia University in New York, and I said, Betty, I'm not going to move anywhere to just be a curator of a go-down. That's what she called it, it was a go-down. 
and, uh, and so it'll have to be preservation and research, and then I'll do it. So we, I did come out in 77, and, and she was very generous, and we established the Ancient Biblical Manuscript Center, which Professor Yarkin was involved in, and especially in the fall of 1980. And, um, uh, she, she, it was, it was, it was really. We had a marvelous thing going, I think. But uh, she didn't know how to deal with scholars. She treated all of us, myself and my doctoral students, as employees. That's the only category she had in her mind to deal with us. And uh, she, she, if you dis, you did, if you disagreed with a single thing she said, the money was likely to slip away. I mean, she, it, was, it was really, it was really, I had a very difficult time, and so did all of my students and Betty Woodruff, Peggy Woodruff. But at any rate, um, that, that well all, by the way, that whole story is, is to be published as an appendix to a book of mine coming out this fall uh, from Morzebik and Tubigan um, uh, on uh, my work on text and canon. Uh, and and uh, that will be all of the whole history will be as an appendix to it. What's that? Yes, it's a Gazamdor Shudir. Yes, a collected essays. Yes, um, and but volume two won't come out until next spring. But at any rate, uh, the story is there, which I checked with about ten different people for accuracy. And uh, so I think you can depend on it. But it, 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 bless her heart, she just didn't know how to deal with us. Uh, we, uh, except to order us around, do whatever she thought was right. I finessed many a crazy idea, believe me. Um, but anyway, I don't know how I got off onto that. Uh, I had to learn how to monotheize with Betty Betchel, I can assure you. Um, <clears throat> she was a generous person and a lovely person if you agreed with her, put it that way. Yes. Sorry, can I ask you a question? Please. Um, first of all, isn't it counterintuitive to be willing to suffer? And secondly, shouldn't we demonize, shouldn't we demonize evil in order not to have to submit to it? Yes, uh, I, think, I think that uh, when we, I agree with Reinhold Niebuhr that there was a possibility of a just war. He, he developed his idea of a just war in order to get America into the Second World War. As you know, we had in this country in the late 30s, we had many isolationists, many nationalists, America first people, including Lindbergh, who did not want us to get involved. Uh, Roosevelt, if you remember, uh, devised the idea of Lend-Lease um, to help the, the British. Uh, and it, it, uh, there was a lot of propaganda in favor of the Germans at that time in this country. But um, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, that released Roosevelt to do what he wanted to do anyway which was to join in the war. And uh, uh, I don't think I've ever heard a conspiracy theory that Roosevelt was in cahoots with the Japanese, thank God. I don't think that's ever been the case. But yes, there is, there is such a thing as just war. And it is counterintuitive to suffer, and I would never advise anybody to suffer. But I thought the whole point was that we have to suffer. No, I don't, I don't think we have to suffer. We have to learn what God does with suffering. But if we don't demonize our enemy, then they're probably going to kill us. And that suggests suffering. Yes. If we, we, if, if we fail to demonize our enemy, we learn what, is, what we are like in them. And that is what I think we should do. And that if that involves suffering, okay. But suffering is not okay. I agree. So we have Lent, during which we say, instead of suffering, we'll learn to do without for a while. We have ways in which we learn how to understand that everything that we have is a gift of God. And that's the thing that's 
that we have to focus on. Everything we have is a gift of God. Can you talk a little more about 67 and these guys changing from Zionists or from Reform? Yes. Um, I, yes, I was in Jerusalem, and, um, and uh, we scholars in Jerusalem, the American school, the French school, and the British school all ended up on the east side, fortunately, because um, the Jordanians needed us more than the Israelis did. But, <clears throat> but we uh, met often, and, uh, and we, when, when, it, when Nasser, Yamal Abdul Nasser, claimed that he had mined the Tehran Straits. Um, we didn't believe it for a moment. We knew that was Arabic hyperbole. But they did believe it, I found out later, in New York. And uh, we scholars said, look, if there's going to be a war, it will take about two weeks for Israel to win. that will be the most, it would be two weeks. We were wrong. It took them six days. Um, but we got, I got home, and my dear, dear friend Abraham Heschel um, could not understand what I was saying. He just couldn't understand, because he had been in New York the whole time, and they were scared to death. I, did, I didn't have any experience anybody getting scared to death. And um, uh, they thought that it was a nace, a miracle that the Israeli army had defeated the seven Arab armies within six days. Those of us who had lived there had, were not at all surprised. Thought it would take two weeks, but... Um, uh, so Heschel and I had a hard time for several months. I wrote an article, uh, uh, Kyle Hazelton, who was the editor of Christian Century, published out of Chicago, um, asked me to write up my experiences. He says, I hear you've just been there. Would you write it up? I did. And it was published in the Christian Century of July 24th. And, um, uh, and in it, I, I, I gave it the title, Urbi et Orbi, Jerusalem 1967. It was a takeoff from the Pope's address to the world. Um, I, I made it the genitive Urbis et Orbis. He had the date for the address. So to the world and to the city. And uh, <clears throat> I ended, I entertained the five different solutions for the disposition of the city of Jerusalem and opted for it being an international city. When I got back to New York, I was just, I was vilified. I vilified. I, Professor H.L. Ginsburg came across the street, knocked on my door and shouted at me that I didn't deserve to be in that office and so on. Um, they had thought it was a miracle. They had thought it was a, a nace. And I knew it wasn't. I just, <laughs> I'd been there. And um, Heschel, in the meantime, was so convinced that it was a miracle that he wrote a book that was published later that fall entitled uh, Israel and Echo of Eternity. Undoubtedly the worst book he's ever written. His daughter, Susie, agrees with me about that, by the way. She's a professor at Dartmouth. She's an adopted daughter of ours. <clears throat> and um, uh, I, mean, I should say uh, not adopted at all, but it, uh, as it were. And um, it, it, uh, it, it's been very interesting to, to uh, was very interesting. But Heschel and I were very close those seven years. You see, he, he was professor at Jewish, Jewish Theological Seminary, but my first year as professor at Union Seminary in Columbia, 1965-67, Heschel was the Fosdick visiting professor at Union. So our offices were next door to each other. We became very close. We took walks every afternoon, either along Riverside Drive or along Broadway, and, and uh, we were very, very close. But that fall of 67, uh, we didn't see each other for months. What, the first time we saw each other after all that was in early December, I think it was. I was going to the Union bookstore along the corridor from the rotunda to the bookstore. There's a narrow passage. Well, Union Bookstore at that time was the best theological bookstore in New York City. I mean, it was without question. And if you wanted to see a, a professor from Jewish Theological Seminary, you went to the Union Seminary Bookstore, 
because that's where you'd find them, more than likely. And that's where he had been. So we met in this narrow passageway. He was coming out and I was going in. And I said, Heschel, we've got to talk. He said, yes. And the first question I asked him, I said, how could you write the book, The Sabbath, and then write this book, Israel and Echo? I knew you would ask that. So then we were back walking on Broadway again. Um, uh, it, it, it just was two different worlds. And I had been in one and he had been in the other. Yes. Okay, if um, the monotheism process goes on, what happens to Christianity? Ah, I'm glad you asked. I couldn't wait. Okay, because that was going to be my closing remark. Um, <laughs> um, it's God's Christ, you see, not ours. And that is the first thing we must learn. Because our attitude generally is that our Christ has revealed God to the world. And we send missionaries out to say that. And what we should, on the contrary, try to learn that it was God who had lived in huts and hovels of the slaves in Egypt before he liberated them, gone with them for 40 years in the desert, clouds and fire pillars, entered into the land. And the Christian story adds on to that. If the God who had done that, in other words, could cross the Jordan with Israel and go up to Jerusalem, why not Bethlehem? It's only seven kilometers down there and the shortest route. I used to recite that to my friend, Jacob Joseph Petakovsky, who became the distinguished professor of rabbinics later on at Hebrew Union College. We were classmates. And I, and I said, if God can go all the way to Jerusalem, well, first of all, with Joshua, uh, and with Moses and with Joshua and with David, why not Bethlehem with Christ? Oh, too far, it's too far. And I said, well, it's been pretty long distance. Because, you see, the Jews had a difficulty with in, the concept of incarnation. But if we monotheize the concept of incarnation, we should see it as another point in the story of what God has done in love of humanity. Then it means that Christianity has a stronger mission, it seems to me, than one that says that we have the answer and we're giving it to you. On the contrary, it means we have answers, you have answers, we learn from each other. Because God works elsewhere as well as in Christ. So what about the people who don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God? That Jesus is what? The Son of God. Oh, I think God loves them every bit as much as he loves us. Same as he loved that widow up there in Tyre in, 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 in Lebanon in 1 Kings 17. So we have a long way to go. A very long way. So you agree with the Muslims that Jesus is just another prophet? No, I think more than that, because I, we wouldn't say Not that, just that, that God... Not a great prophet. Yeah. I, I, would, I would agree that the story says that God lived a human life in Jesus of Nazareth. Why? Not because to lift Jesus of Nazareth up or the Christian church up or what, but to show the world that God loves all of us and suffers what we inflict upon others, as we in the Romans inflicted upon the Jews. But how's that different from Muhammad? Hmm? How's that different from Muhammad? I mean, surely Muhammad was also... I, I, I would like to work on that. So do you think it was God hanging on the cross? <laughs> yes, that God identified with that human who was crucified because of our cruelty. We in the Romans. God hanging on the cross. Well, this is what you meant. I, I'm, I'm trying to tag into this with your uh, phrase, the need for a theocentric hermeneutic. Yes. Rather than a Christocentric hermeneutic. Yes. We, Christianity has developed for centuries and no more more so than in Karl Barth, a Christocentric theology. 
theology was centered in the Christian story only, or finally, or ultimately, or something like that. And what I would like to see us develop is a, is a uh, uh, theocentric Christology. That is to say, one in which we understand that Christ was a gift of God, but there were other gifts of God as well. Would that be like Muhammad's another gift? Yes. I, I, I would think that we would have to try to learn from, from the uh, Muslims. Remember, uh, we, we, uh, we often forget, in fact, I think many Westerners don't even know of the, of the three centuries in which Arabs were dominant in Andalusia, and all three religions were free to exos be exercised as they would, as they will, as they, yes, as they would. And then came these Christians called, called um, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, and threw all the Jews and, and, the, um, and the Muslims out. Whereas in the three centuries before that, but you know, we wouldn't have most of Aristotle if they had not translated Aristotle. I'm talking about theologically, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. How are they different? How are they different? Oh, I think God is at work in different ways throughout the world. But how do we say in talking to people who are from Islam and they, they'll ask, uh, well, you talk about having the same God we do. What's this Trinity? What's this Holy Ghost that wanders in there? What do we do with this concept of the Trinity? We're trying to go to monotheism. Uh, I, that's in my little book, The Monotheism Process. I try to deal with that. Uh, the um, the uh, um, Trinity idea from Tertullian uh, in the third century was an attempt to, um, to understand how uh, we could have three persons and one God. And the emphasis was on the triunity, the triune God was one God, but with three gods. The, I think we should go back and look at the heresies more carefully because there were equally prominent views at the time that were not Trinitarian, that Christ was a human or Jesus was a human all along and was not elevated to divinity status. Um, I'd like to look at that again. Not that I would agree with everything, but I think it'd be important to look at it. What, what, what were they, Mon, not the Montanists, what were, you learned all the heresies. <laughs> yeah, why about it? Um, yes, I think we should stop calling others heretics and look, maybe call ourselves heretics for a while. <laughs> well, I mean, this is always my, I wasn't really raised in religion, so. Raised how? I wasn't raised in a religion, uh -huh. so it's always bothering me that if there's a God, uh, you know, why are there all these different religions trying to, you know, kill each other, call, you know, heretics? I mean, it just never makes sense to me. Because of tribalistic thinking. We have, we have, we, we get to be tribalistic. No matter how big the tribe is, it's still a tribe called Christianity. And that's the danger of an excessively Christocentric community. Yes. We end up being a tribe, mm. uh, doing the same old thing, yes. elevating, elevating it to the extent. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas if we work out a theocentric Christology, yeah. it seems to me we could at least avoid that pitfall. And that's the difficulty. You know, imagine God on a tribe. Well, but yeah, I mean, one wants to be part of a tribe um, because. I mean, you mentioned that the, the nomads weren't tribal. They, they had no, of course, they had enemies. They would kill the tribal enemies. What would they? Sure. Oh yes, we've always I killed. They, they had no enemies. They just wandered around. Yeah. They didn't go down to the borders, national borders. The nomads. They, they wandered into the border of a, an enemy tribe. They would, it would be a huge war. But they wandered around the place, don't they? Well, it seems human. And, all our inner cities, the young people form gangs, try to kill each other. I mean, it seems to be this yeah. animalistic instinct. Yeah, it, is, it does seem to be an instinct. And uh, I think that the 
enduring value of this Bible is its monotheizing thrust that we try to get rid of and to overcome the tribalistic instinct. Uh, it, it, um, uh, astrophysicists say that the world, uh, universe, multiverse is increasing all the time, uh, expanding, expanding. It's not that our world is shrinking, it's just that the multiverse is getting so big. And we are a very s small planet within that, and we think so highly of ourselves. Thank you, Bill. I'm glad to see you and Ann again. Hmm? Oh, yeah, that's the, that's the 10th. Yeah. yeah our, my colleague of mine and his wife were were um, uh, killed in an automobile accident last few weeks ago, and Bill's thinking about the memorial. So I want to thank you all for enduring this. Thank uh, you. I know it's been hard for some of you, but I appreciate your coming and uh, gave me an opportunity to, to uh, expose some of these ideas. Not that it's the only opportunity, but it does help. Thank you.